Morning folks, I'm Dave Canterbury with Self Reliance Outfitters and the Pathfinder School. What I wanted to do today was make a video for you guys that would go into a little bit more detail on my favorite resource tree of the Eastern Woodlands, which is the tulip poplar. And the tulip poplar, or the tulip tree, is not really a poplar at all. It's actually a magnolia. It's just called a poplar. It has very similar properties within the inner barks the carving properties and things of that nature that other poplars have, like cottonwood and basswood. It's got a different leaf on it than any other poplar, and it used to be called also mother-in-law shirt. And if you look at that leaf upside down, it kind of looks like a nightgown, and it was called mother-in-law shirt. The tulip poplar is one of the tallest trees in eastern woodlands. It grows to approximately 135 feet. So you can readily identify them a lot of times on the landscape if you're on high ground by looking for the tallest trees in the landscape and generally there will be a tulip poplar if those trees are around. The tulip poplar is prized for its carving qualities and it was one of the first trees ever exported live to Europe from the continental U.S. for those carving qualities. So it is a tree that we can take advantage of in bushcraft to give us lots and lots of resources to be used from everything from fire making to implements around camp to basketry, cordage, all of those types of things to include medicine. So let's take a look at some tulip poplar over here in the classroom and we'll talk more about that. Okay, so let's look at a couple things real quick. First of all, this is a piece of tulip poplar that's been cut down and bucked down and the bark's been stripped off of it. And you can see it's a very blonde, light colored wood. Generally, the pith or the inner hardwood of this tree, the heartwood I should say, will be purple or green. So if you find some wood out in the woods somewhere and you're not sure what it is, and you split it open, if it's got a purple or green heartwood to it, a lot of times it's very likely that it could be tulip poplar. Right? You also have the same color heartwood sometimes in red cedar but the wood is a completely different color in red cedar as well. It's not this blonde light color like this. So that's an easy way to help you identify it. It's also a very soft wood, which makes it great for carving things like feather sticks. So let's look at that real quick as well. So we'll take this green piece, just set it up on this tabletop for a minute, and we'll take this dryer piece that we've got laying here and we'll kind of baton it down in half. The other good thing about poplar is if you get a good clear piece that doesn't have a lot of knots in it, it will split fairly straight for you. And that's another good quality when it comes to making things from the poplar is that it has that nice splitting quality. Now, for feather stick making, this thing does really, really well because you can take very, very fine shavings off of that thing. So you can see the carving ability of this wood makes it ideal for making feather sticks if you choose to use feather sticks as a fire starting aid, especially once that wood is good and dry. Now, because it carves so well at making feather sticks, it also carves and shapes really well for making other projects like spoons, bowls very quickly, and things of that nature. So this is a very good wood for carving, but also very good for fire starting because it's very quick and easy to make a nice feather stick out of this. And most of the time, if you've got this good and dry and your feathers are nice and thin and you've got lots of nice curls on it, you can start this on fire with a ferrocerium rod only and not have to worry about a live source of flame to get the job done. You could also drop a charred ember in there of some sort like punk wood in between a couple of these and pinch it between start a fire that way as well okay so when we're talking about the bark of this poplar this tulip poplar 
if we get the dried bark where the tree's been dead for a while, where it's dead standing, we can peel the bark off and it will come off in sheets. And the inner bark is fairly easy to then separate from the outer bark, just like this. Or you can also take that and you can just twist it down and that bark will start to come off by itself. And that lends itself to making bird nests. So once you get this thing opened up, you're going to start to expose these very, very fine fibers that you can see here. And that's going to give you the makings of your tinder bundle or your bird nest for more of a primitive type fire, whether that be flint and steel percussion fire, or whether that be a bow drill set and some type of a friction fire. I've got several videos using tulip poplar to make friction fire with and using tulip poplar bird's nests or tinder bundles for placing an ember in and blowing them to flame. And I'll try to put some links to those on this video. If your bark is a little bit newer, and this was just stripped off the other day, so it's had some time to dry out, but it's not dead by any means. It's still got a lot of moisture in it. Then it may be a little more difficult to separate the inner and outer bark. But because of that, this makes really, really good containers. So I've got videos on that as well. And again, I'll try to put a link to those videos in here, but you can simply score this bark on the back side and fold it to make containers. I'll show you a quick example of that. We'll imagine that this bark is quite a bit wider than it is. And if we just cut through the outer bark in kind of a football shape here, just like this, we want to make sure that those that eye meets and then when we break that over just like this we then have the bottom of our container in that football shape and we can then lace that up the side now that would also make an impromptu knife sheath if you were to cut that off to the right size and lace it up you can make an impromptu knife sheath out of that or a container for lots and lots of other things whether that be a needle case something to hold your bone all all those types of things up to and including large baskets for like berries and goods like that that you collected from the wild to store them in. But getting this bark off of here to get to the inner bark is what you're going to want to do if you want to make cordage or if you want to make basket materials. And to do that you're going to kind of have to rib this down a little bit. There's a couple ways you can do that. When this bark is at this stage it's really best to wet this to get this job done because the wetter this is the more pliable it's going to be so the best bet would be to soak this for a little while to remove that material we're not going to do that right now because i just don't want to take the time to do it so we're going to just take a piece of this off and split it down and by making it less width we can effectively do the same thing it just won't be near as pliable for us. So what we're going to do is we're going to, so we're going to try to split off the inner bark from the outer bark, but we could probably split this down more than once fairly easily. And I'm just going to start it with my knife and then we're going to do it with our fingers. And again, we could probably split this down more than once if we had this wet. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start to bend this and strip it off and what we want to do is whichever side it's pulling to that's the side we want to pull on if it's starting to get fatter on one side than the other the fat side is the side we always want to pull and what this is going to do is it's going to allow us to separate the inner bark and the outer bark you see i got that big fat spot right there so i'm pulling hard on that side to get that back to the middle now I'm starting to get fatter on this side, so I want to pull on this side to get it backward toward the middle. And you just kind of have to work that. Again, if this thing is wet, it's going to be much easier to do this than when it's dry. So let me rib this the rest of the way off of here, and then we'll get to talking about making cordage with this material. Okay, so we've got a piece of this material cut down. Now, what we should talk about real quick with this before we even worry about making cordage out of this, we can use it for what's called a withy. And a withy is generally made from willow. But anything that's flexible that can be used as a tie, 
a lash or a binding can be called a withy. I could take this inner bark just like it is in a strip, not even worry about making cordage out of it, just kind of twist it down, and I could use that to tie something together with and tie a full on knot in this thing, just like this, and it's not coming undone and it's not going to break. So, a withy like this is a quick and dirty way to use this for cordage or use it for a lashing or a tie or a binding that's not going to have to make you go through the process of making cordage and you can see that thing is just fine and we could use it over and over again again the wetter it is the better off we are now for cordage we're going to want to split this down so i just split a piece off and i'm splitting it down the side and just kind of keeping it even along the fibers you can see how those hairs are starting to kind of break away a little bit don't pay that much mind just kind of keep it as even as you can it's almost the same thing if it starts to run off on you pull on the pull on the thicker side to kind of get it where it needs to be you really don't want to cut this with your knife or run the, or your knife down it like it's a piece of leather you can do that and do this with it and it's not a big deal, but the problem is it's going to weaken things up because you're going to cut fibers. And we're a little wider up here at the top. That's not really a big deal. Now we've got something here that's going to make some really nice cordage. We just got to get it twisting. And the best way to do that really at this point is to get this wet. And we can do that two different ways. We could soak this for a little while or we could chew on it. Okay, so now we've kind of got this stuff wet. And this is by no means a small piece of cordage. This is actually... A pretty large diameter piece but now all we really have to do is start to kind of twist this down in our hands and expose the fibers a little bit and kind of soften it up and as we're doing that you can see those fibers starting to expose a little bit once we get this to where it's twisting up we'll be ready to make some cordage out of it and we'll just twist it until it twists on itself just like that and then we'll begin to do a reverse wrap cordage technique I've, again I've got videos on this as well when you're using flats like this you really have to pay attention to getting this stuff twisted down because it's going to be flat instead of round if you don't do that but this is a quick way to make cordage without processing the fibers all the way down you could process these fibers down even further and it would make better cordage but you can see that it is for the most part round because I'm not twisting it until I've twisted it two or three times and then I'm twisting it over so I'm twisting each piece a couple three times before I turn it back to make sure that that's going round instead of staying flat and that's important but this is going to be a heavy enough diameter cordage really that that could probably be used for a bow drill fire without breaking if you had a good set and you didn't have to sit there for 20 minutes messing around with it so You've got a lot of resources in this poplar tree. We'll kind of go over those again one more time. Okay, so back to looking at this tree and explaining kind of why it's my favorite resource in eastern woodlands. Looking at it from the outside, you've got a tree that's very easy to identify. It doesn't look like anything else. As it grows, it drops its lower branches, so it generally has scars on the side of the tree because it's trying to, trying to attain photosynthesis. So you have... A tree that probably for the first 20 feet of the tree in a deep canopy is going to be nice and straight with no branches on it, which is why Daniel Boone probably made his canoe from a poplar because he didn't have to do a bunch of limbing to get the job done. He just cut the tree down, cut the large trunk off of it, and made his canoe. Beyond that, you have the outer bark, which can easily be used for container making, which we've talked about and I'll put links to on this video. Once you get to the inner bark of the tree you have material that you can make not only withies and cordage out of but also baskets when it's dry you have a material that you can shred down into fine fibers to make a bird nest or a tinder bundle you have a soft wood when the wood is dried out for making feather sticks and things like that for creating fire and if the wood is green it's a very good carving wood to make camp implements like spoons bowls dough troughs and things like that and then the tree itself is medicinal in the fact that it's astringent and it has drawing properties. So you have a lot of great bush crafting qualities in one tree that is 
really one of the most prevalent trees, at least in my area of the eastern woodlands. And it kind of takes over because it's very, very prolific. You can have a tulip poplar that's two years old and that thing will be 20 feet high. Whereas you might have a hickory that's a couple years old that might only be five feet high. So it grows very, very quickly. And it will also grow from the stump very easily. So if you trim it back, you're going to get multiple shoots like you would with willow if you are practicing coppicing. So it's a very, very renewable tree. It's also a prolific tree and it's a very usable tree for what we do in bushcraft and woodcraft. And that's why it's one of my favorite trees in Eastern Woodlands. And I wanted to start maybe a small series as I get time here on specifics about trees, starting with my favorite one, the tulip poplar. Now, I will tell you that I apologize for some of the little short dink videos that I've put up over the last couple of weeks, but it's really all I've got. I can't really take the time to try to film things when I'm being paid to do something else. It's really not right to people. I'm getting paid for an appearance or paid to do a presentation. Filming that and then putting it out on YouTube is probably not the most honest thing to do as far as taking care of the people that are taking care of me. At the same time, we're doing a lot of traveling right now. We're doing a lot of teaching right now. I just got back from Scandinavia and the UK. I just got done with a class yesterday. I have another class that starts at the end of next week, it's a pioneer class. Then I have a class training some military folks for a week after that. I have a blacksmithing class that starts the day that military exercise ends. And then not long after that, I have to leave for Japan for the Japan Mark and Eve adventure. And I get back from Japan one day before the Pathfinder gathering. So you can see my schedule is pretty overloaded right now. And so I apologize for the lack of quality content and the amount of videos that I'm putting up but I'm really trying to do the best I can and stay true to my YouTube viewers as well and kind of keep getting them content as I can. I appreciate your views. I appreciate your support. I appreciate everything you do for our school, for our family, and for our business, for all of our sponsors, instructors, affiliates, and friends, and I'll be back with another video as soon as I can, guys. Thanks.